what so uh who am i let's move to the next one okay let's go there we go uh it's up good uh my name is john Volberg, and i am the uh, team director of black mountain composite uh, unlike all of your other speakers who have very long lists of impressive credentials i have only the credential of having shown up for where i was needed for like my kids which grew into this 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 thing right so i call myself the accidental director right um if you've ever seen those you know those comics of like like people in the military and the sergeants like i need a volunteer and everyone else steps back and there's the one guy who's not paying attention who's like still standing forward and that was me okay so here i am um mechanical engineer by training software engineer by trade um so i'm a really good bike mechanic because i understand bicycles at a level that you know it's just it's a machine and i'm very good with machines uh I race cyclocross, I race cross country mountain biking. Then because I love racing cyclocross, my kids got into it because my kids got into it. They wanted to do like the high school NICA mountain biking thing, but there was no local team. Well, there was, but it was ending. And so in order for that to continue, here we go. All right. Um, so I have, I have a ton of topics that we could cover, but I have more than we're going to want to cover. So part of what we're going to do is uh i'm gonna pull you all and say well what do you want to cover and and my apologies in advance to the people on the web i brought a bunch of stuff i have boxes of things i, I this is like is this a talk or is it show and tell right mm -hmm. a little bit of show and tell so all of you are on zoom um you won't get to see everything that i brought uh so you'll have to i'll do the best i can but um it's not quite the same as actually playing around with this stuff. But so I was gonna go through, this is just sort of like getting started on dirt. You know, what types of bikes do people use on dirt? What if you wanna race? Equipment, you know, how do you progress through the trails so that you don't get hurt? Um, uh, getting kids out there, right? Um, and, and dirt skills. Um, so, uh, oh, and so I got a couple, I don't have as many pictures as I, as I could have, but uh, I brought a couple of fun ones. So, so for people, uh, you know, you get a lot of people like if I, first, first question for the group, raise your hand if you know how to ride a bike. Right? Good. All of us. Um, does that mean that you can ride your bike in a difficult situation, you know, on a difficult dirt trail? You know, no, raise your hand though if you have ridden your bike in difficult on difficult dirt trails, right? Okay, so a lot of you have. So I have a I have a fun video that uh we took at, at Cyclocross Nationals two years ago. And this is this is what happens when you get a bunch of guys who have great road skills and great road motors, and they're like, I'm gonna race cyclocross nationals, right? And we'll see if this goes. Unable to play video. I'll wow. try that again. Um, bear with me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna redo the present. I'm gonna try one more time. No, it's not gonna go. I'll show you this video later because it's hilarious. Um, I'll figure out a way to, to re-log into this. But but it's a bunch of guys in this in this muddy cyclocross race going down this steep thing and and racer after racer they're just going over the bars it's like a circus of these guys just go woo you know wow you know and just tumbling down this muddy hillside one after another there's like three of these guys um and then the next video which which you won't get to see either most likely um and I keep going through it. The next video is of me riding down it. I'm not going particularly fast, but I'm going faster than the guy who's behind me who's running down it, right? Um, and and it's just like, and and when you watch, you know, you know how it's with videos. When you watch me go down it, it doesn't look like I'm stressed or it's even that hard, right? 
but trust me, that was, it, it was, I, if I can get it up, that'd be great because it is super hard. So, all right. Um, uh, so, so there's a, there's a, there's a huge gap between, yeah, I know how to ride a bike and yeah, I can safely ride that bike on that trail. Right. And so you got to know how deep in are you getting? Right. So who has a, who here has a cyclocross bike? Anyone? All right. You got one. Who here has a gravel bike? All right. You got one. I don't have a gravel bike. I got my hand up. <laughs> who, who here has a mountain bike? Wow. A lot of you guys. Okay. Um, who here is thinking about like a new gravel bike or a new mountain bike or, or, you know, sort of expanding what they do in terms of dirt? Anyone thinking about expanding? No. Well, All right. There we go. All right. Um, and does everybody does everybody live generally in this area, or do we have anybody who lives like North Bay, San Francisco? Okay. Um, East Bay. Anyone? Nobody. Okay. Campbell. Campbell. That's that's close enough here. All right. Um, Okay, in terms, so we've got some, a bunch of you have, have mountain bikes and, and some dirt bikes. So um, have any of you ridden at a Rastrodero? All right, Good. how about Calero? No? Fremont Older? All right, there you go. Uh, Russian Ridge? All right, Sanborn? Uh, John Nicholas Trail? All right, uh, Austin, you're going to raise your hand for all of you. <laughs> Maybe not all of them, let's see. Um, so Bella Vista Canyon, that's Black Mountain. You read, you've done that. Okay. Um, how about demo? All right. Well, boy, we we'll just jump right to demo there. Uh, Fort Ord. Okay. That's a cool spot. Uh, how about further out, like Granite Bay? You want to go in there? You've been there, right? Uh, Never been there. Six, 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 no, that's not Grant. That's okay. Uh, six, six, the only people who've done Six Sigma are the um, are the high school racers because that's private property. That's like, it's like, hey, let's go to some guy's winery and do a wine, uh, not a wine, a, a mountain bike race there. It's really fun. It's fun for the parents too. Um, has anyone ever done a Downeyville show? Really? All right, those are fun. Uh, riding at Tahoe and Bear Valley. Anyone? Okay, well, we've got some. We've got some uh, more advanced riders here. There's a gap, right? So, um, all right. Let's see what we've got from there. All right. So, number one is you know if you talk about if you talk about like getting a bike and kind of riding it on the dirt and, and what was that bike made for and can you do this thing that you're you know that that this bike was or wasn't made for and the answer is it's always a spectrum. Like, yeah, maybe that bike wasn't made for that, but I can find a guy with the skills to do what, you know, what you would normally say, no, that bike can't do that, right? And you might say, well, yeah, but did he land it? And yes, he did, you know, without even like a bump, right? He's so smooth. Where is that? This is at a Rastrodero. This is the little bowl, you know, and he, he took off from, from one of these ramps like down here. And he landed it like over here. You know, this is we've got like the full shots, right? But um, but he, you know, I can't do that, right? Um, but he can do that, you know. So I, I made a grid <laughs> that's kind of like, yeah, but but what about for like the the rest of us? You know, if you've got a bike, you know, it's it's kind of like. These bikes just, they go in line. They're made for different things. They go from sort of the lighter, faster, but less capable. They're not gonna help you as much down to the thing that's like the heaviest, most, most capable, most helpful in terms of technical stuff. But, you know, man, you gotta, you need a ride back up to the top of the hill. It's not meant to be ridden uphill, it's not meant to be paddled. Um, people get stuck too on, uh, so I've got like this, you know, how much does it weigh? How hard is it to, how good is it at going uphill? How good is it at going downhill, right? How much skill is required to ride this thing, right? Um, 
you know, and it's, you know, how much, what, what tire pressure are you going to set this thing to? You know, it, it, it kind of, these things go in almost straight lines. As you go down, either they get, they get worse or they get better. Um, but it's funny too, people, people get stuck on even the clothing thing. Like, what do I wear with this bike or this type of trail? And so there's this, there's this spectrum of like, like what's the right clothing? Because when you ride, when you talk about riding on dirt, it's just, there's this huge spectrum from the top to the bottom. It goes from, you know, oh, we're doing cyclocross or, or even the, the cross country racing, right? Well, I'm, I'm wearing a skin suit, right? I'm wearing spandex. It's, I mean, I, I dress the same exact way I would for a road race, right? Um, but when you get down to the bottom or just when you get down to trail bike, right? If you're wearing your, uh, if you're wearing your spandex and you show up and your friends are all like, you know, Dude, what's this? You know, you, you feel a little funny sometimes. So you get yourself some baggies and a, and a mountain biker helmet. So show and tell number one, um, everybody stand up and we're going to, we're going to grab some bikes. So I've got some bikes scattered around. I'm going to pull them out. So for every single one of this category, you can find a few bikes emerging. Except for a cyclocross. Cyclocross bikes are fundamentally race bikes. They're probably <laughs> all right. So you can grab a bike, a great source of time to like talk in the front. Yeah. Um <laughs> all right guys, I'm showing off. A small amount of my bike collection. It's kind of fun. Oh, wow. All right. So I want you guys to pass these things around and kind of feel them, but, um, so bike number one, cyclocross bike, it's pretty light. It's not as light as a road bike because it's, it's kind of big, it's mine, I'm told. Um, but, uh, you know, do I, do I own a gravel bike or a road bike? Actually, I don't. When I wanna do gravel, I put gravel tires on this thing and, and they're right over there. Um, oh, they're right here. So, you know, you say, whoa, shoot. It's a gravel bike. It's not really a gravel bike if you put gravel tires on it, but it works for me because I've got the skill to kind of bridge that gap. There you go. Okay, then. Um, thanks, Amy. <laughs> so, so all right, I can put those on there. Now, with the cyclocross bike, it wasn't made for gravel so I can't put like really thick gravel tires on I, I can only put thin ones on but a thicker one on the front than on the back but just put thicks um a lot of times bikes are they're so specific but they're, they're only made the frames are only as wide as they need to be but you go with the progression we've got a hard tail this is one of our team loaners we want to kind of cool um it's still pretty darn light and that's it's not an expensive bike. That's an entry level race bike. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty good at climbing. It gets you in a lot of places. But, you know, if you look in the spectrum of things, it's still pretty high up in terms of the skill required. Um, but it's a lot less expensive. And it gets you out there uh, on the easy trails pretty well. And so that's good. You know, we don't take the kids who are starting out on the most difficult trails with a bike that's not going to help you that much. You know, you take them somewhere where they're going to have fun with the equipment they have. Moving up the stack a little bit, we've got a full suspension cross country, like full blown racing rig. Yeah, it's big like that. Um, this guy is, is sort of light and fast, but has a rear suspension that's going to help you on the down. And so that's kind of fun. And then, um, let's see, I'm going to ignore the one you have, I'm sorry. 
Okay. Um, and then so um, the furthest end of the spectrum, you've got this guy with um, with a long travel and a really slack geometry. Um, the really the, the fattest tires, right? And uh, this one's made for you know jumps and drops and and things like that. Um, but it's still it's a trail bike, so it still climbs pretty well. Uh, this morning, that bike was in Lake Cunningham, California, being ridden by somebody, like being ridden by the kid who was in the picture of the flying like Ted Scott rider. So that bike gets to do what it was made to do, for sure. Um, but it's also pretty heavy. You can pick that thing up and be like, wow, I didn't know a carbon bike could be so heavy, right? You know, because you think of the carbon bike. Um, now the pink one here is is here just what you're when we get to the tech part of our talk. This is this is the bike that's, that showcases all the tech that was top of the line 20 years ago, <laughs> and how much things have changed and what a difference it makes. All right, find a place to park the bike. Thanks for for looking that. I don't own an enduro bike. Or a downhill bike, right? Uh, but this gives you an idea of the spectrum of bicycles. It's kind of fun. You know, and in just the same way that I look a little funny, if I wear my, my spandex on my trail bike, I look a little funny if I wear my baggies on my cyclocross bike. Uh, same with the gravel bike. So um, there's some in the middle where it's kind of get, gets gray. You see people wearing baggies on their hardtails and wearing spandex on their down country, you know, full suspension. Okay, down country full suspension. If you take my racing, uh, that that uh, S Works Epic thing, the really light fast one. If you take that and put a slightly longer front travel shock on it, it becomes a down country bike which is just saying it's, it's almost like cross country, but with a little bit of downhill mis mixed in. It's basically what you have, right? The, the Epic Evo is, uh, is like, it's like they invented the category just about. All right, so that's a little bit of fun. Um, any questions on types of bikes? Um, okay, if you're looking to get a bike, get the one, so. A lot of people right now are falling in love with gravel bikes. They love the idea of it, especially if they're coming from the road. Um, if you or your friends are going that way, point out to them that the level of skill you need, especially to ride a bunch of the trails around here, to jump in with gravel, if you're going to go on some of these trails, um, it's not a good place to start. You're much better off starting with like a full, full suspension cross country bike or a down country bike. Um, or even a trail bike. If you've got a good road motor, but you have no dirt skills and you want to jump into the, the off-road scene, I mean, get a trail bike. Let the bike help you learn the trails and learn dirt. And then move to the more difficult, you know, go ride the squirrel later, right? The, the squirrel, the squirrely ride that's going to that's gonna require, you know, all that more skill to ride a, a, even a simpler trail. Conversely, if you've got a kid who's like, like into the machine and they're like, I've got this totally capable bike, but then they, they're just bored riding the bike because they can't find a trail that challenges them. Stick them on a hardtail and say, well, go ride that today then. And suddenly that same trail that used to be boring, ain't boring anymore. Uh, now they got to pay attention because the bike is not helping them the way the other one did. All right, racing. Oh yeah, I can take that off the side now. Nobody's raising their hand on Zoom anyways. Thank you, Tom, there we go. All right, whoops. So yeah, and now Zane, Amy, I'm gonna skip through some of these super fast. This one's kind of fun to spend a little time on. Um, but Amy's gonna provide a link to this. So some of this stuff I have in here is gonna just be for reference. You're like, oh wait, what was, where did that fall in that spectrum? You can you can look it up. You can look it back up later. Uh, if you want to race, um, 
I'm not actually going to really cover that right now, but I'm going to say that on the Black Mountain website, we've got a, we've got a few pages that have some great tips on getting ready to race, on your first race, on good and bad goals for racing, on, you know, oh, yeah, bicycle security. Um, and I actually, I, I have a show and tell item for bicycle security, which is kind of fun. Uh, so I'll talk about that, but, but there's a couple of links here. Um, so uh, for bike security, like one of the main things is um, mountain bikes are expensive, right? You've got one and, and now road bikes, like, like when you buy more of a road bike, usually you get a lighter and lighter and lighter road bike and more aero. But when you think about like the riding experience on a road bike, the more expensive the road bike is the riding experience better is the way it handles better it's maybe a little bit but it's it's pretty similar it's pretty comparable you're not getting more powerful brakes or more you know more stable you know cornering experience you're just getting something that's faster faster and faster and of course the, the, the money curve just really gets higher and higher like what is it thousand dollars an ounce or something silly hundred dollars an ounce whatever the rule of thumb is for road bikes when you get up to the top right um, and you're just cutting off weight. With mountain bikes, I mean, up until you get to like, I'm gonna say six or seven thousand dollar mountain bikes, um, you're buying capability, right? That thing can can do more and more and more. Only up above like seven thousand are you getting into that that sort of yes. Now the rest of what you're getting is just that extra edge for racing. Okay. Um, so these things are expensive, like. Like my truck carries eight kids, or sorry, seven kids plus me and eight bikes, okay? And so when we go out and ride to the trail, this thing has an unbelievable, it's way more money than the truck is worth, right? Um, sitting out there. And yet, you know, we put a little, a little threaded cable through these things or the cable that comes with the bike rack and say, let's go into, you know, Burger at Santa Cruz, right? And think that the bikes will be there when we come back out, because they won't be. Like that, that stuff gets snipped through like butter. So um, we either have somebody watching the bikes or we lock them up to the wheel. And uh, well, show and tell item, you know, this chain, it takes as long to grind through as, as a U lock. So I don't know if you want to pass it around. It's a good, it's a good workout. Okay. So uh, right there. Ta so we've got a cool chain and a and a and a U lock, but you know we lock this stuff up. We lock it to something solid. Um, yeah, and that's the short chain. The long chain is wrapped up around the bike rack on the back of the truck. So that, yeah, you got to. So you have my permission to stand up and carry it to the next person. All right. All right. Um, so for your equipment, I'm just going to say that like, like, uh, gloves and glasses are pretty much just as necessary as wearing a helmet when you're out on dirt. Uh, if you slide out and you plant your hands on nasty gravel and stuff, oh my gosh, it's, it's you know, get some gloves. So. Get thin gloves, get full finger gloves, but, but wear your gloves. Um, the rest of this is probably pretty obvious. Um, you know, the helmet is really more of a style question, right? I've got a road, uh, here we go, pass it around. Right? I've got a road helmet and a mountain helmet, depending on what you're wearing. Okay. A road helmet, I wear this on the cross country bike, right? My wife's mountain helmet. Got a little more coverage in the back, um, a little more. It's gonna it's gonna protect you in in a little a better variety of situations. A um, little little hotter. Little uh, got that nice visor. Um, when you're riding off road, glasses with a rose tint and especially the 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 color uh, the darkening lightning ones, those are the best. Um, <laughs> All right, carrying stuff. You guys have seen, I'm sure, 
Handle back. I really like to just now. Fanny pack. All right. Um, why is the fanny pack better than the camelback? Anyone? More return to gravity. Yeah. Kind of. And, and it's cooler, right? Doesn't doesn't make well. Okay. In the summer, I love a fanny pack because it's not as hot, and it and they don't rattle around as much. In the winter, I like the. You know, I usually have the jackets and extra layers and stuff. Then I like the camelbacks. Plus, they keep me warmer, right? The kids don't seem to need that, but I do. What am I carrying? All right. Um, does, Ed, does anybody need to hear about like the different kinds of shoes, right? Whether you whether you're doing clipless versus the flats and the SPDs versus Crank Brothers, anybody anybody interested in hearing about like shoe and pedal nuances? All right, not getting any not getting any raised hands so far. So I'm going to just skip that one. I have example pedals and shoes in here, but we will skip those. Um, okay, minimum minimum like trail repair equipment. Pump, tire, tire, you know, pump tube, tire tools, and trail pliers. I'll show you some trail pliers in a little bit. Um, so what do you need this stuff for? It's so that if, when you get that flat tire and you have no cell service, you're, you know, three miles from the nearest anywhere that someone could pick you up or further, right, with a car. Um, it's, always, it's always more fun to walk, to ride out than to walk out. And, you know, flat tires are sort of the number one, number one thing. Um, now, if you're, if you're leading a ride and you're going with friends, then you have a list of things that is a little more complicated. You're gonna bring a, a spare cable, a chain breaker, some lube, some zip ties, first aid pack, right? Um, master link prop pliers and spare links. Um, I keep all this, pretty much that entire list is, um, So most of what I'm talking about is literally in this little keg here, right? I don't, I, don't, I carry as little as I can. Um, if you're running tubeless, so the pliers, the master link pliers, and the trail pliers are sort of one and the same. It's got this little thing that's just like a pair of pliers. So you're like, yeah, I've got a. I've, I've got a spare tube, or I've got a pump or whatever, and I can pump this thing up and your valve core comes loose, right? Or you can't get your valve stem out from your tubeless setup so that you can put your tube in. And so you've got the stuff, but you can't get it in or you can't get it out. These trail pliers are sort of the cure to all those problems. You can use this thing, this little Y-shaped thing will tighten down your valve core. Um, these pliers can hold onto that lock ring so you can get that off. And put in your tube. Um, it also will take apart your master link on your chain, and I and it has like the spot for for spare master links in it. This guy I use all the time. Tire levers too. But, but yeah, so that one's worth seeing. All right, so that's a little bit of fun for for that. Uh, all right, any questions on bike equipment for, for the moment, what I've covered so far? Good? All right. So bike tech, there's a whole world of bike tech um, that I can go through. We could talk about geometry, disc brakes versus rim brakes, through axle versus quick release, one by drivetrain versus two or three or whatever by. Talk about your suspension lockouts, uh, 
you know, tubes versus tubeless versus tubular, uh, the size of your wheels and, and the whole nine yards. I actually already talked about price versus capability. Um, but do you guys, is there, okay. I'm gonna do a little bit of something with the tubes and tubeless, tubeless. Um, but do you guys wanna, do you guys have questions or wanna, wanna hear uh, stuff on any of this other stuff? Yeah. Sure. Um, disc versus rim nuts. So you know what they are. You've seen them, right? So I'm going to give you the bottom line is for almost every purpose of a serious cyclist, disc is better, right? That's your bottom line. But, but why, right? Um, disc brakes work in all weather and they're, they're much more consistent. You have more power. You have, um, if you have something that makes your rim wobble, like you blow a spoke, or you just your rim's not perfectly straight, or you know, or you've got like a little scuff at the at the seam of your aluminum rim or whatever, all that stuff that makes your braking uneven. Uneven braking is like an invitation to skid. You know, you're going on hard braking and it gets around that spot where it catches a little bit, and then suddenly it, it catches, and that that's it. You lost traction. You were pretty close to the edge of it, now you're sliding. Okay. Uh, disc brakes almost never do that. They give you this nice, smooth, consistent braking in all kinds of weather conditions. You know, they're not close to the water. They're not close to the mud. They're not dipping in the dust. They're not riding through the creek, right? And even when they do, they handle it much, much better. So these are, and, and, and when the rim wobbles, the disc doesn't, right? All of these things are really the thumbs up for disc brakes. What's the problem with disc brakes? One, they weigh more, right? Like my cyclocross bike here, it's race weight's about 18 pounds. I, my older cyclocross bike, that was like all, that was two by and rim brakes, whatever, it was like 17 pounds, you know? Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that go into that, but the disc brakes themselves were responsible for like about half a pound of extra weight. So, um, and would I trade them? To go back to the rim brakes, not in a moment, not for a second, because the amount of control I have and you know the happiness I have riding my bike with the, the disc brakes on there is so much better. Okay. Now, if I were riding a bike like to work and back on flat thing and or school and back or whatever, and I and I, I was worried about somebody stealing it because I had to leave it out a lot of sides. Rim brakes are the best, right? The cheaper the bike, the better. Um, cool. Uh, most of these things, I'll just say, like, once you've gone to disc brakes, you never go back if you can help it. Same with through axle, right? With through axle versus quick release. I, I, I'll never go back to quick release. Quick release is the pits compared to through axle um, in terms of living with it, getting wheels on and off, and in terms of how, how securely your wheel is attached and the, even the feel of the bike, the, the bike feel is it handles better because you don't have this little flexy bit, you have something super secure. Um, one by drivetrain, Do you, does everybody know what I mean by a one by drivetrain? You guys all know? Good. Once you go to a one by drivetrain, you will not go back with the exception of if you need to do loaded like road touring or, or even bike packing or something like that, then a, then a two-by can come back. In just about every other situation, you won't miss it. All right, tubeless versus tubes versus tubular. I have a, I have a fun little show and tell item for that. All right, let's see, we're gonna cut away. Uh, so this is a tubular rim and tire. Tubular, now here's where it gets fun. So, okay, who here can say Irish wristwatch? Try it. Irish wristwatch. Anybody have trouble with that? All right, so this is a tubular rim with a tubular, a tubeless tubular tire in it, okay? However, some tubular tires are tubeless and some tubular tires have tubes. Okay, what makes it a tubular tire? What you'll see is the tire itself is a circle, right? And it's glued to the rim. The only place you'll find these anymore, you used to find these, like they're called sew ups and things like that. The only place you find these anymore is in like 
world-class cyclocross racers. Everyone else has said, these things are a royal pain in the butt. I never want to see one again, which is part of why I have a cut out section for mine. Um, so pass that around to, to take a look at it. Um, it's glued on very securely. You can pull on it. Yay. All right, here's my show and tell item for a tubeless tire. Right? What is tubeless? So this doesn't have a tube in it, right? How does that work? You've just got a, a valve stem in here, right? This little rubber stopper. I've got a piece of tape partially on here, a real tubeless setup would have tape around the whole rim, but you can see the tape covers the, the spoke holes and keeps the air from going out there. So, so you, you trap the air between the tape and the tire, and then you put some sealant in there and you fill it up. Now you can imagine that this block ring has to be pretty tight to keep that valve stem sealed in the, in the inside. And that's where those pliers come in. So now you get a flat tire, because it happens. And how are you going to get that lock ring off? It's hard. Pliers are really handy. So here we go. Not that guy. So with the toothless, yes. you get a flat tire. What goes flat? Great question. What goes, OK. So does everybody know why tubeless is the only way to go for dirt? All right. Yeah, you can run the inside lower gives you a lot more control. Right, lower pressure means better traction. What else is tubeless good for? Sealing. Automatically sealing little punctures, right? Awesome for that. It's a, does, do you, when you run that lower tire pressure, do you have higher? Why, do you, why can you lower your tire pressure? Because you don't have a tube that you're trying to protect from getting pinched, right? It's not there. There is no tube. <laughs> um, but don't you get lower rolling resistance or yeah isn't it higher rolling resistance when you run lower tire pressure right and aren't you going to have that and with the answer with tubeless is no why is that because when you think about like like imagine where did that foam roller go that's okay so you know how when you foam roller your leg you just have this point of like of like pressing in up and down, right? As you roll along on the road, you have kind of the same thing. It's like the road is providing this, this foam roller going along on your tire and it deforms that spot and then it kind of pops back up. And that deformation, right, of, of the tire pushing in and the tube kind of has to go with it. And the tube and the tire, they kind of, they kind of scritch against each other and they move and they, there's an internal friction in all of that. So when you, when you uh, take away the tube and you drop your tire pressure down to where you'd get a lot of internal friction if there was a tube there, but the tube's not there, you generally don't suffer the loss, right? That rolling resistance. So you get, you get better rolling resistance, right? Lower rolling resistance when you go tubeless. Uh, they've measured that, it's very, it's very clear. It's usually a little lighter weight, unless you put in tons of sealant because you're like paranoid. Um, and then maybe, then it comes out about even, right? Uh, so this is a slightly, uh, maybe off uh, yeah. the topic question, but um, is uh, with the advantages of tubeless or uh, dirt bikes, are they uh, similar for road bikes or not? It sounds to me like um, there isn't a strong case for Okay, so the advantages are similar for road, but the case is much, much weaker. Okay, and if you want to, so if you want to talk pragmatic, right, I run tubes on the road and I run tubeless on the dirt. Okay, and um, have you ever tried to get a tire off of a rim on a road bike where the tire's on really kind of tight? Have you ever had trouble with that? Okay, so. On, on dirt stuff, right, you run, like, like the highest tire pressure I had on my chart was probably like 30 PSI, okay? Right? Oh, that's, not, that's for your gravel, gravel bike or whatever. For my cyclocross bike, it's about the same. And, and th other things are like 25 PSI or whatever. Now you go tubeless on your road bike, what, what tire pressure are you running? 50, 55, maybe 60 at the highest. 
okay? Um, but that's still a lot of pressure. And did you see that pass around? Did you see that, how thin that tape was? Okay, now that tape has to hold, you know, 60 PSI of pressure from poking that hole through. And you've got to have, your tire has to be on so tight that it doesn't get pushed off, right? When, it's, when there's no tube kind of uh, helping things to stay together. And so those things, those things are wicked tight. And so when you get a tubeless flat on road, and you better have some metal tire levers and some patience because it is hard to get that thing off. Hard, okay? And so it's really hard to, it's kind of hard to live with it and work with it. The guy at the bike shop um, taught me, well, actually, I have tubeless yeah. tires for my road bike. Yeah. But I never actually put them on. I never got around to it. And when I was talking to the guy at the bike shop, he was convincing me that it was probably not that great an idea to do. Um, I mean, I have tubeless ready tires and I just run them with tubes. Exactly. <laughs> right. No, no, really. I mean, that's what I do. Too. Yeah. But, um, are you still running them at 60 or something like that PSI? Uh, generally, I am, yeah. But they're, they're larger volume. I'm running 32s, okay? If you've got 32s on carbon rims, I mean, you, you can look up Envy. Envy has a table of, for, your for your table, for your tire size, and, you know, which rim you have, or generally your rim width, how high of pressure. Most people run tire pressures that are way too high. Um, and Envy's got this whole thing. I mean, yeah. the bike guy again was, was trying to get me to run with it. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, if your road bike will go up to like a 28 or a 32, dude, you should try it. It is so much more fun. Like the, the and a little lower tire pressure. You're like, wow, I never, I've never felt so secure descending in my life, right? And it's because you're not skating around on these little bu -bu 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 things, right? Right. When you got ice skates for tires, it's not as much fun. Um, it's just not. Yeah. Um, I have some friends that really like the uh, yeah. Like that one. So, yep. That's a good. That's a good tech question. I should have put that on. So you guys can see this thing, right? It's really clear when you watch it. I've got an oval on this guy over here. See the small one? You can see this guy. You know what? I just didn't ask him what kind of accident caused that. Ah, um, so the question, uh, was what do I think of oval chain rings? And so the two bikes in this room that I ride both have them. So I'm a fan. Does it put stress on the derailleur? No, it doesn't. But here, watch the derailleur as I pedal backwards. Yeah. You can see that it does bobble a little bit. Yeah. Right? See how much it moves it? But all you're doing is working against the spring. I mean, this thing's job is to is to move back and forth as you shift up and down. But it's not like it's going to wear it out faster. Yeah. It really won't. Um, so if I were riding on road, I wouldn't bother. And of course, if you have two gears up front, then it just doesn't work. Don't even try it. Yeah. Don't, don't even go there. <laughs> OK? Um, I mean, I've seen, I've heard that there are setups that do oval with the front with a two by, but I've, the mechanical engineer in me says, I'm sure that works great all the time. Not, right? There's a slight mechanical advantage to the oval. So, what does the oval do? So, does anybody remember like the biopace stuff from like 30 years ago? Anybody, anybody hear about that stuff? It's in the white tube. I don't remember the white tube, but Shimano did did oval chain rings a long time ago, and they and they were a complete failure, right? Well, except for shifting. Well, they right they couldn't shift real well with the meter, but but people were like like wow I hate this and I don't see what benefit it gives me, and it's because they put the, you know basically it makes it a little harder for part of your pedal stroke and a little easier for part of it. 
And Shimano put the hard and the easy part in exactly the wrong places, okay? In terms of what you actually want. Um, what these ovals do is they make it harder in the place where you have the most power in the middle of your downstroke. And they make it easier when you're trying to draw across the top and bottom. And so when you're riding on dirt and you're climbing up something steep, okay, and you're trying not to slide your rear wheel, right? What do you got to do? You got to pedal as smoothly as you can. Because if you go shove, 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 like if you stand up and try and ride up something steep, what does it do? It just goes, shh, your rear wheel skids. You stop and you go, ah, oh, didn't make it up that climb again, right? Whereas, you know, and, and, and the people with the clipless pedals, they're having an easier time because they can pedal smoothly in a circle. People on the flats, they're having the hardest time because it's really hard to put in even pedals, even power at the top and bottom there when you've got flat pedals and you're kind of pressing and dragging, right? Um, an oval chain link, chain link, really, it makes it that much easier. It's like, it's like you get to shift down a gear where you're weak, and shift up a gear where you're strong and it allows you to smooth out your pedal stroke right um and and make it that much easier to climb up a steep technical ascent okay because you're much less likely to get stuck in the top and you're actually less likely to skid out on the power stroke um so so i like it i'm a big fan uh but not everybody does. Um, what's the disadvantage? Really, the main disadvantage is, you know, you got to spend eighty dollars on a chain ring when your other chain ring isn't going to wear out for the rest of your life. You know, so um, that's it. All right, I'm going to go back to an earlier question, which is, when do you need to? When do you get a flat on your tubeless setup? And the answer to that, um, you get flats on your tubeless setup when you have forgotten to put stands, you know, sealant in your in your tire for like six months, and there it's actually all completely dry. And then you get a little tiny puncture, and it doesn't reseal. Why isn't it resealing? Oh, because there's no stands in there anymore, right? That's one. That's like the number one reason. Number two reason is that you with your lovely low tire pressure and high traction, and, and maybe you missed that brood or rock and you went bang, okay? But guess what, if you hit it hard enough, that pinch flat that you don't have to worry about for your tube, you will still pinch flat your tire, okay? And when you do that, but when you do that, you get a hole right here at the edge of the rim, and then one up here on the tread. And the one at the very edge of the rim, that one almost never will seal, okay? It tries to steal, seal, then you start to ride it and it's the tire kind of flexes and stuff. It just opens back up again. It won't seal. And so there you go, you got a flat. And then the other one, the one that there's really no getting around, is you're riding along and you let your, your wheel slide off the edge of some rock or something. And the edge of that rock turns out to be sharp and you get shoot. You get a sidewall cut that's half an inch long. That's it. If you don't have a tube, you're walking. You're done. So, so that's when you need to, you know, and, and when, we, when we get that on the trail, because that happens, all of the above happens, right? And now they have tire plugs. You, you know, for some, of the, for some of the pinch flats, you can actually, and some of the bigger punctures that won't seal, you can actually stick uh, like, like a piece of, there's a little seal, a little plug that you can stick in there. Uh, you know, have you guys seen the, the the plugs that they use? You know, that they would sell for nail repairs in your car tires. It's like the same thing, scaled down for a bike tire. Um, yeah. But yeah, other than that, I mean, tubeless. Oh my gosh! So my favorite tubeless story is that my son was sitting on the starting line. At a cyclocross race, right? And he's like, Dad, what's that sound? And I'm like, and, and he's riding, he's riding a mountain bike, right? 
and it's set up tubeless, right? It's like, Dad, what's that sound? I'm like, what are you talking about? This kid's got fantastic ears, like, like amazing ears. He's like, what is that hissing noise? And I'm like, that's not good. So I bend down, you know, go like this, and I hear it. It's a little hiss. And you know, so he's got a he's got a nice puncture going in his tire. So, so I spin the tire around to where the puncture is, and I go, you know, he's still sitting on the bike. He's like, oh, oh you know, he's, and I, I kind of kick it. So I imagine there's a little puddle of stands down here. I put it right down where the thing is, and I kick it, and you kind of see this little split of, of stands kind of come out, and then it stops. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, I think it'll hold. And they blow the whistle. I'm like, well, go. And he goes, and it helps. He, he raced like that, and that was good. He had, he had a good time. And in fact, he never did anything. Yeah. Maybe you could jump to basic skills. All right. Skill. So tire pressure, suspension setup. Make your tire pressure as low as you can. Here's a ride checklist. I'm not going to go through it, but we have this posted on our wall. Um, we have it posted on our wall, and there's enough stuff you got to bring as a as a mountain bike rider. There's a little more stuff that you bring. I swear, every time I go through this checklist, I'm like, oh right, I forgot that. Uh, this is also for reference. It's a trail progression. Like if you if you are a beginner, if you have a beginner in your life, and and I'll get to that actually, then you know this is a, a progression of trails you can go through. And you'll notice things like UCSC is on the beginner list, it's on the intermediate list, and it's on the advanced list. <laughs> okay. In some of these places, you have to know which trails you're talking about because you can, you know, you can get your know, demos on the Demos on the intermediate list and on the advanced list. So the first time I went to demo, I did not know any of the trails or really what I was doing very much. I was like super new to mountain biking and following other people who had been like running the, the, the mountain bike high school team. Um, and they're like, yeah, let's go do bacon. That's on my advanced list. I came away with a broken rib. All right, this is, this is a little blurb about riding with kids. I'll just say riding with kids is a blast. Okay. Um, Austin's probably in this picture. Yeah. Yep. I think you are. All right. Um, all right. Does anybody have kids in their life that they wanna they wanna get out onto dirt? All right. You do. I don't know. Kids are friends. The only thing I'll say is just because it's your favorite trail, don't forget how long it took you to work up the skills to get there. Try not to kill your friend on their first outing of mountain biking, right? It's like, hey, I gave you this massively capable bike to borrow. And <laughs> let's go do this. And, and they're, they don't want to be your friend at the end of it. Um, all right, bike skills. Let's see, there we go. Um, this is just a fun picture that does demonstrate a little bit, you know, uh, that the weighting and the bike body separation and, and everything, when you've got minimal traction and it's all about, you know, being smooth and, and digging in your knobs, it's, um, it's not the same. Like on a road bike, you just, you just tilt with the bike, right? On a mountain bike, you don't want to do that. You know, you want to kind of stay upright. And, and, and tilt the bike kind of back and forth. Let the bike turn tilt Well, you don't. Um, and this, bike, this picture shows a little bit of that. You can see how he's got, how he's got his, his, you know, his weight off to one side. He's really weighting his outside foot, which isn't always what you want to do. But when it's extreme, then you do still want to weight your outside foot. Most of the time, it's level pedals. Anyhow, basic skills. What do we teach the kids first? You know, braking, right? Like I can't tell you how many kids come in and we're like, when do you use your front brake and when do you use your rear brake? And they're like, well, we always use our rear brakes because your front brake will send you over the bars, <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, that's true if you let your weight get forward, but if you've got, you know, if you've got your weight on your feet 
and your hands are not super weighted, you know, then where does all your braking power come from? You know, and it's your front brake, right? If you want to stop, you got to use your front brake. What's that? I was like, if you want to stop, you better squeeze that front brake. And Pretty, back. That's exactly right. Um, so we teach them, you know, when it, when things are straight and clean, right? Use that front brake. Uh, when when the when you're cornering or when the when you're when the the hill is kind of going sideways underneath you, stay off your front brake because you hit that front brake and it starts to slide, and and what do you what's happening? You're going down, right? You're going to go splat. Whereas if you if you hit your rear brake and your rear brake starts to slide, are you going down? Probably not. You know you can usually ride out a rear brake skid. Right? You have enough time to react and let off it and, and kind of ride that out. All right. Um, balance. Um, you know, like a lot of uh, okay, a lot of people are like. When you want to when you want to start up a ride through slow stuff or, or even tricky stuff you're like well i just got to have enough speed to go through this and speed can can save you but what really gets you a lot further is working on the balance um the better balanced you are um the better uh the easier it is to ride difficult stuff right because you're not trying to rush your way through it um so if you can work on learning to ride really slow and learning to ride in tight little circles, it can help a lot. Um, and that's just some drills you gotta do. All right, body position. Uh, so when I say heavy hands, light feet, right? Um, actually, Austin, can I get you to do a static here? You can or you can you can be you can get on the bike and be my demo guy, or you can just hold the handlebars. You can hold the handlebars. I'll be the demo guy. All right. Um. So if I'm going on a level level thing, there we go. If I'm riding level, I might look like this if things get rough and choppy. If I'm going downhill. How do I, you know, and I got to keep my weight on my feet. I got to get back, right? Oh, and I'm cheating too, right? See that, I got that dropper post. Dropper post makes it really, really easy to, um, to, get, to get low and get back and get behind the seat. And so if I'm going down a super steep hill, I, I might look like this, right? And if I'm climbing, not climbing, climbing, then you're like on a super steep climb, you're like scooting forward till, you're on the very tip of the nose of your seat, and then you're you're just sitting on that, climbing up it. Um, the main thing I wanted to show was that uh, I'm going to show one more thing, uh, and that's the, what we call in NICA, We call it the ready position, where you've got kind of tight hands, loose shoulders, right, and you're not sitting on your seat. You're using you're using your physical, your human suspension, right? It might be like, I don't have a suspension on my bike. Well, yeah, you do, right? It's your arms and it's your legs. And it's the biggest suspension you'll ever find on any bicycle, right? The, even, a, even a downhill bike doesn't have as big of a suspension as this, okay? And it's your most important one. Um, so in the ready position, thanks, Austin. You know, you're ready for your front end to move around on you and you're ready for your back end and, you, and my, my butt's not sitting on my seat. What happens if I go over a big bump on my rear wheel and I'm sitting on my seat? That bump kicks the bike up, the seat, which is connected to me, kicks me forward. And where am I going? I'm going over the bars. And I'll tell you, going over the bars can get ugly. Right? That's how we break our collarbones, how we mess up our shoulders. Right, and you probably have a longer list of on that, but, right? Um, a, a patience that you see. Uh, so, just 
know, in everything you do, just kind of saying, okay, I'm going to have heavy fan, hands and light feet, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kind of let the bike do the tilting, like, and not be connected to it. And I'm going to drop that dropper post. I'm going to get a dropper post, right? And I'm going to drop it when things get at all technical. That goes so far. Knowing which brake to use, right? Front brake is where your, all your power is. Rear brake, that can be good too, as long as, as long as you've got a little traction back there. Be the suspension. All right. Honestly, one of the biggest, oh, there we go. Look where you want to go, right? It was kind of fun to hear, um, who was it? Was it Ted talking about descending? Saying you don't want to be looking 10 feet in front of you when you're descending? That's true for road. But if you're, if you're riding around a really tight switchback, actually 10 feet is just about right when you're going slow, right? Because you know, you're here on the switchback. I'm looking. I'm not, I'm not looking right in front of me, like right in front of my wheel. I'm actually looking at the exit of the switchback as I'm coming out of it, and then get in on a little bit beyond it. The faster you go, the further you need to be looking ahead, right? Um, but but in, in, in addition to looking ahead, it's incre incredibly important that you look where you want to go, because where you look is where you will go. And if you're like, Oh my gosh, that, that drop off there is super scary and I'm afraid of it. And you're looking at it, guess where you're going? You're going over the drop off or that tree or that rock or that root you're looking at. Never look at the thing you don't want to hit. Okay. It's like a life. I mean, we teach the kids this. This is like a life lesson, right? Don't focus on the thing that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be or where you don't want to end up. Focus on where you want to get to. Work on that. Absolutely. Look where you want to go. Or like in a crisis situation, some car is pulling out in front of you or whatever is going on. Do you look at the car or the thing that you're worried about hitting? No. You look for that escape path, right? You look for the way out. That skill is critical. Um, all right. There's another one, though. I call it the smart progression. Okay. Um, don't let anyone talk you into doing something that you don't feel like you're ready to do, right? Um, everybody's got a, a little internal traffic light. They look at something and they're like, I can do that, no problem, that's your green light, right? Or you might look at something and you go, I did not feel comfortable doing that, that's your red light. When you get a red light, listen to it, stop, walk it, at, walk it through, okay? And then there's the yellow light. You look at something and you're like, I think I could ride that. Then you have to ask yourself the second question, which is, do I feel up for that today? Do I feel up for that little bit of stretch? Am I, am I warmed up? Am I feeling good, right? Am I, am I ready for this? And if the answer is not yes, then you gotta, you gotta just say, no, I'm just, that's, I could do that, but I'm not really there today. That's not what I'm doing today, calling it off. Right? And you get off and you walk. And if your friends are like, oh, you could do it, you'd be like, not today. You know? So, You're going to come back another day. Yeah. So, so again, maybe this isn't the right question for here, but do you um, have anything that teaches people how to fall? Ha. Huh. You know, um, interesting question. So, the kids that we have, there's a spectrum of kids, but it's always fun to pick on the extreme ones. There's some kids that crash every ride and every race. There's other kids that never crash, okay? The ones that crash a lot, um, like the best advice I have for them is go take a, like a tumbling course, you know? Go, go learn a little parkour, because usually then that they, you know, and, and one of our head, one of our training coaches, he'll, he'll even teach that in the core class. He's like, Hey, we're going to do some tumbling today. Um, and, and that helps to build in some of the reflexes to kind of tuck and roll, um, and, and roll out of some of this stuff. Uh, but I'll be honest. Um, I prefer, you know, building up slowly. Like, like if you come up to 
a jump or a drop or whatever, and you're like, I think I could do that. But then you ask yourself this other question, have I ever done a drop that was half that height? Or have I ever done a drop at all, right? If the answer is no, then, then go ride your bike off the curb in front of your house, right? Or, or something small in a safe environment, learn how to do that with good form and be like, oh, this is nothing now. Then go take it out on the trail and do something bigger, right? Same with things like jumps, you know? Like, oh, am I gonna do this gap jump where there's like a takeoff and then this, this little space of nothing and then this landing, you know, when I haven't done like smaller gap jumps and then, you know, gap like, tabletops where there's dirt filled in, you know, don't go there, right? Until you're absolutely confident you can do that gap jump because you've done a million other jumps that are similar, but safer, you don't go there. Um, and in terms of how fast we corner, we're always running. I always tell the kids, don't ever run over 80% of what you think you can do. I'm like, but how am I going to get faster, coach? And I was like, you know, it's interesting. And you run at 80%, you're relaxed, you focus on your form, you look for smooth, good lines, and you get faster and faster. You're, that 80% of what you think you could do is always getting faster, right? I mean, some of the fastest kids in the league that have done this, have gotten, they've gotten so fast, never crashing, never really pushing it over 80%. And, you know, and now, and they know when, you know, in a race, they might run it up to 90%, but crashing is always a really slow thing to do in a race, right? It's like, it's never faster to crash. All right. Um, we're almost at the end here. Yep. So do we have time for two more slides? We are, all right. I'm not gonna go through all this, but as a mountain biker, learn to read the dirt, okay? You, like, as a road biker, you can kind of phase out, you can look at the, you know, you can look at the scenery, you can check things out, but as a dirt bike, uh, when you're riding on dirt, you're paying attention to every, like, every little bit of dirt. You're looking for loose stuff. You're looking for slippery stuff. You're looking for, you know, the places where your traction is good or bad or whatever. And, and you're paying attention to all of it, okay? Um, and the number one cautions I will give is that you know, wood, roots, anything metal, be real. When those are wet, they're like ice. I mean, they are like, it's not like, oh, I've still got some traction. No, you have you pretty much none. I mean, literally none. And so if you don't go over it in a perfectly straight line with zero breaks, and you know, you're skating and good chance you're gonna go down, right? Uh, but the other thing that's especially tricky this time of year is what I call loose over hard, where you've got hard packed dirt and on top of that, you've got little rocks or little dust. That's just like marbles of various size. You know, if you, you imagine walking around on marbles, well, riding on the marbles is not much better. Um, so watch out for that stuff, but then learn to find all the stuff where you do have good traction because there's fantastic traction out there. Um, look for the places where you have it. So learn to read the dirt and know what's coming, right? Uh, and the other thing is picking lines. Um, uh, you know, when we talk about lines, you know, we, we know what we mean on road by, by lines, right? It's the outside, inside, outside. And that's still true when you're trying to go fast on the dirt. Um, but on the dirt, you see the lines, right? You see where everybody else is going. You see the line where, you know, when I'm coming down Black Mountain behind, you know, six JV and varsity riders, and, and they're all way off in front of me. I'm, I'm riding along, I'm reading the dirt. I get to, a, I get to this one spot that, and I see this fresh line just carving off into the sides. What am I doing? I'm slowing down and I'm like, is he still down there, right? Is there a kid in a pile down in the poison oak, right? So that's my first thing. I'm like, no, nope, he's not. And then I come down to the bottom and I'm like, who went off the edge at the such and such spot? You know, all right, let me check you out. You know, sure enough, it's all scraped up, right? One of my kids went down, right? Um, but what you really want to look for when you're riding is you want to look for the common places that all that the that people ride, right? There's uphill lines, there's downhill lines, there's easy lines, there's hard lines, as in difficult lines. And um, 
And it's really easy when you're beginning to kind of go to see the uphill lines where people are kind of weaving the smoothest path and say, oh, that's the line I want to go down on, right? But those are kind of a kind of a trap because when you're going downhill, even if you're not going super fast, you mostly want to just roll over the obstacles in a straight line. All those obstacles that you weaved your way through, when you're going downhill and you're braking and you start weaving around, that's a great way to wash out your front wheel or not make the weave crate quite right and kind of have your front wheel catch on something, right? Um, you know, you see a rock in the trail. Like, like if you see a rock the size of this, this Epson here, this little projector, and you look at it, you might be like, oh, I'm going to go around that. But oftentimes, the best line is like right over the middle of it. Because the edge of that thing, that edge, that's the thing that's dangerous. That bump up over, your wheel runs right over that. But that edge, I mean, that's like, that's the thing that can catch you. And you're like trying to turn, and now you can't. You're sliding along it. Down you go, right? If it's a long parallel edge, watch out for those. But so always value straight lines rather than the tricky lines. Because you can get your weight back and kind of ride it out, let the bike do its thing, brum, 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 and you'll go over amazing things. If you try and weave through all this stuff and get tricky, it's a lot easier to crash that way. So yeah, watch out for parallel edges, um, straight lines, roll the middle of the rock, not the edge of it. Don't, you know, don't, don't want to go through necessarily the gaps and go over the bumps all too often. Um, and when it comes to jumps and rollers and things like that, where you're like, I don't really want to become airborne. Almost all of them have bypasses. You know, before you before you go jumping off jumps, learn how to roll over it and like keep your wheels on the ground. You know, unless it's a gap jump. All gap jumps, any place that you might go where you're like, oh, I didn't know there was a gap jump here. They'll have a they'll have a little trail around it. Take the trail around it until you're like, yeah, that gap jump is what I'm coming here to do today. I've looked at that gap jump a million times. Right? I've done smaller ones. I'm ready to ride the gap jump. Otherwise, take the bypass. I'm saying with other jumps that come up and you can't avoid them, you know, you can almost always use that huge human suspension to just suck the bike up and roll, you know, push the bike up and down as it goes over the thing, keep the wheels attached and, uh, and keep, it, keep it on the ground. You don't have to go launching into the air today if you don't want to. All right. That is what I had today. Um, so, but I, I'm happy to hang out a little bit after and take any questions. Um, Real quick, see if there's any questions from the Zoom crowd and then we can. Yeah. Just go. But other than that, thanks for, for hanging out. Thank you. It's been a long day and uh, you guys are troopers. Thanks for coming, everybody. All right. Thank you for supporting Black Mountain. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you, Amy, for putting this on. Um, that, Looks like there's one question there. All right, now that's, a, that's a hand clap. Oh, that's a hand clap. I thought that was oh, a raised right hand. There. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, we're gonna log out. If you do have any questions, uh, you can always shoot me an email. Thanks for coming.